Good morning, High Point. Welcome to Church Online. We're so glad and excited that you could join us today. Today we are continuing our series. Now I have to look at my notes because the title is quite long. Thank you, Andy King. Uh, Our series, What to Do with the Impossibly Difficult, Overwhelmingly Complicated Problem of People. Woo! It's a mouthful, but it is incredibly relevant, and it is what we need to hear at this season. Uh, We are working through 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, that is one of the most famous passages of Scripture. You've probably heard it read at a wedding. If you're married, you may have had it read at your wedding. You might have it embroidered on a pillow on the couch you are sitting on right now. Um, It's one of the most poetic and most often quoted passages of Scripture. But it's also one of the most powerful and convicting passages of Scripture. And that's why we've really decided to take our time working through this because in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul is laying out for us the way that we are meant to live, the way that we are meant to love. And it is so counter our human nature and so counter our culture that we are camping out here for a while. And so I'm so excited to have the opportunity to share with you today. So why did Paul write this letter to the Corinthians. We know that the Bible is God's living word. The scriptures say that the Bible, the word of God is living and active. So we know that the Bible is for all people, all cultures, across time and human history. So the Bible is for us. But the Bible was also written in its time, to a specific audience, to a specific group of people. And so why did Paul write this letter to the Corinthian church? What was happening at the time he wrote it with that group of people, with that church? What can we learn about that that helps us understand the purpose of the scripture? Well, let me give you a little background. Corinth the name of the city that the Corinthians were living in, was a busy port city. There was a lot of commerce. There was lots of coming and going. There was lots of people from all over that part of the world that lived in Corinth. So you had Greeks, Romans, Jewish people. You had all types of different cultures all mixed in together. And as a result, the church itself was a multi-ethnic, diverse church not only diverse in the sense of ethnicity, but in the sense of uh, social class, in the sense of status and wealth. You had indentured servants alongside the wealthiest class, all learning to serve God together, all coming together as a community of faith. And everything was perfect all the time, and there were no issues. Uh, no, sorry, not so much. You guys, this church had loads of conflict and issues. And that's why Paul wrote not only 1 Corinthians, but also 2, because they were learning how to live together, to serve God together. And there were a lot of problems. And if you read 1 Corinthians, Paul deals with a lot of those issues. There were divisions among them. There were factions of people arguing. There were church members that were suing each other and taking each other to court. There was sexual immorality. There were people who were getting into worship services and basically seeing who could interrupt the other and who could preach the best sermon. It was a wild time. It was a wild time. So Paul wrote this book, this letter to the Corinthians to try to help them, to try to say, no, no, guys, listen, this is how to live. This is how to behave. This is what it means. And so oftentimes we think of 1 Corinthians 13, you know, the love chapter, as maybe an affirmation of what was already existing among that church. And maybe Paul was like, you guys, you're so good at loving each other. Isn't love kind? And isn't it patient? No, I want you to understand, and we need to understand, that 1 Corinthians 13 was an instructive teaching on how to love. And he wrote it because they didn't get it and they needed to understand it. It was meant to give these Jesus followers and these Jesus followers, 
their marching orders, right? It was meant to help them understand how to live like Jesus, how to love like Jesus. And so I want us to read those first five verses this morning. I want us to, we're going to, we read a passage of the chapter every week during the series, and this week is no different. So let's look at the first few verses of 1 Corinthians 13. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. That's quite a lot to unpack. And today, we're going to focus in, we're going to zero in on the first part of that verse 5, that love is not rude and it does not demand its own way. So what is rudeness? I think we probably all have like an instinctive knowledge of what rude is, um, either because someone has been rude to us or because we have been rude to others, probably a bit of both at times. But basically, rudeness essentially is inconsiderate or inappropriate behavior. So Instead of saying love is not rude, I could also say love doesn't act inappropriately. I could say love does not belittle others. Now, I was thinking about the idea of rudeness and how sometimes we can be rude and not know that we've been rude. And a good example of when this can happen is any time you travel internationally, right? So if you've ever traveled overseas, sometimes you have to learn about things that maybe are acceptable in the culture that you're coming from, but would be considered rude in the culture you're traveling to. So whether it's certain hand gestures in some countries or certain words that are okay to use here, but maybe where you're going would be considered rude. When you travel, you make the effort to begin to understand what would be taken the wrong way in the place you're traveling to. We are often in those contexts attentive to not wanting to offend others, right? Now, in our own context, in our own culture, we get a little lazy and not so worried about that, and I'll get to that in a minute. But travelers, that's a time when we, as travelers, we often go to great lengths to understand what might be considered rude because we don't want to offend anyone. Now, the story I thought of, from our own experience when I was thinking about this aspect of rudeness is from our very earliest days when Jason and I lived in Sydney. Some of you know that uh, Jason and I moved our family to Sydney, Australia. We pastored a church and lived there uh, for several years. And one of the cultural practices in, in Australia and in a lot of countries around the world is that you greet someone with a little like kiss on the cheek, right? It's not actually, you kind of like touch cheeks and you make the little kissy sound. <laughs> That's the technical term. <clears throat> so I was still getting the hang of this, right? Because we don't really so much do that here. We shake hands or we just kind of greet each other and, and say hello. And yes, in the days of COVID now, we give each other a little elbow bump, right? So here I am New in this church that we uh, are, are now leading and are pastoring, I don't know anybody well because everybody that's coming to church are new, new to us. And so I, <laughs> I was saying goodbye to this new, <laughs> sorry, I still get embarrassed. This was like literally over 10 years ago and I still get uncomfortable talking about it. But I was saying goodbye to this new couple that had come and I was saying goodbye to the husband, to the, to the guy. And 
I knew that we were, had to do the cheek kissy thing. That's the technical term. But as I'm coming in, I can't remember which side I'm supposed to go to. And now I know. And if you need a tutorial, come, come to me. But like, I came in and I hesitated and he hesitated. And like, it all happened so fast, but, but I kissed him on the lips. That happened. <laughs> it's, it's really painful to remember. But the worst thing is, is that I barely knew this guy and I kissed this guy on the lips. I pulled back. We're both horrified and embarrassed at what has just happened. But then he just turns and leaves. And it was the worst, most embarrassing thing ever. And I still die a little bit inside all these years later, remembering that. But I'm happy to say that in our years at High Point Atlanta, I have not accidentally kissed even one person. So I can assure you when we resume in-person service on March 28th, I can give you a zero kissing guarantee. So see, I've learned <laughs> from my ways. Okay, so that story is a cultural faux pas that I made, right? And technically maybe could be considered rude in that sense. But really it was just, I made a mistake and I was, we were both embarrassed, but nobody was really hurt. But when you come into a new culture, you have to understand the, that, the ways of that culture and the way that you may have behaved before, but maybe is, is rude or unacceptable in the new culture. And it's the same with the culture of the kingdom of God, right? And when I talk about the kingdom of God, what I mean by that is that when you begin walking with Jesus, you accept his ways and his rule, and he's the Lord of our lives. And so when we say kingdom of God, what we mean is like the new way of living under God, the new way of living a life in God. And kingdom culture is the ultimate shift. So to make this shift, Paul begins to list out in the chapter 13 all the things that love is and all the things that love isn't. And, and to us, it may seem like, well, of course, it's obvious that love isn't rude, that love isn't boastful or, or envious. But you know what? It wasn't so obvious. And, and even to us here in, in the 21st century, we still find ourselves proclaiming Christ with our mouths, right? Going to church, participating in life groups, yet still falling prey to envy, boastfulness, pride, unkindness, and rudeness. And so we need this message as much as they did. We are called to treat people with dignity and compassion because they are made in the image of God. And so we have to recognize that that is the kind of love that God calls us to give. And if we want our lives to point people towards a loving God, then treating them with dignity and compassion is absolute baseline for Christian living. Okay, we have to get this if we want to really be able to say that we are loving God and living for him with all our hearts. This is, this is ground zero to treat people uh, with kindness, compassion, and to, to recognize the image of God in them and to treat them in such a way. So the scriptures say, love is not rude. Paul says it actually this way in another letter in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 10. Paul says, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Do you take delight in honoring people? Or do you really find more of like a thrill at cutting someone down or being rude to them behind their back? Listen, we have, we've all done it. We've all had that little secret thrill of like finding the perfect thing to say to cut someone down. But, but the scriptures tell us that we need to turn from that way and instead turn to where honoring someone and speaking love to them and honoring uh, the image of God in them should be our ultimate delight. So we see that love is not rude and we see that there's no excuse to deliberately be rude to people, especially as Christ followers. 
Now, one thing that I think we've probably all seen and all noticed is a resurgence, especially even among Christians, of rudeness, of lack of compassion, especially on, guess what, guess where, social media, on the internet, right? Disagreements over politics, over theology, disagreements over, I don't know, the finale of The Bachelor, I I don't know, whatever, (laughs) can result very quickly into things getting personal. And we can fool ourselves sometimes into thinking, well, I'm just telling it like it is. I'm just telling that person the truth, and they need, to, they need to hear it. They need to hear the truth. We can really highly value, quote unquote, telling it like it is, when really what we're doing is just taking that opportunity to vent our annoyance and frustration on someone that we disagree with. But here's the thing, and here's what I think the scriptures are clear about. You might be right. Like your opinion, you might... You might have Bible verses to back it up. You might have life experience to back it up. But the scriptures are clear that the right message delivered in the wrong spirit is just noise. I'm going to say that again. The right message delivered in the wrong spirit is just noise. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 that, I could have all the gifts and all the prophecies, but if I deliver those without love, I am just a clanging cymbal, a noisy gong. It's going to mean nothing. Even when your message is right, if you deliver it rudely or without compassion and consideration, you accomplish nothing. And not only do you accomplish nothing, you don't honor God with your life. And nothing changes as a result. Think of the last time, take a minute here, think of the last time you were rude to someone. Think of a, think of a specific time that comes to your mind that you were rude to someone. Now, it could have been a, a random encounter at the grocery store or traffic. It could be it could be on social media. It could be with a friend or family member, someone you're close to that you love. Think about that time, that specific incident, if you've got it in your head. And I want you to think for a second, what motivated that rude behavior? And even at the time you did it, you may have been like, oh, I'm better than this, or I shouldn't have done that, or I shouldn't have said that. That's fine. But for a minute, what motivated, what was behind that, those rude words that you said or the rude behavior you exhibited? Yesterday, as I was going over these notes, and I was thinking about this for me, a time that I've been rude, Jason walked in and came home, and I said, hey, think, like, what's a time, what's a recent time that I was rude to you? You're like, tell me, like, what was it? What did I do? <laughs> and he immediately got this look on his face, you know, it was like this cornered animal where he was like, this is probably a trap, right? Like, there's no good way. There is no good way out of this conversation. He was like, what are you talking about? What are you? I'm like, it's for the sermon. Like, help me think about, like, what would my motivations be? And he was just like, uh, nope, can't think of anything. <laughs> he would not do it because <laughs> we've been married long enough, right, that he knows, like, this will not end well for him. Like, he's just not going to go there. So, luckily, I could think of, for myself of enough times that I've been short or snappy with him, unfortunately, or other people in my life. So what can motivate our rudeness? Well, sometimes it's a matter of impatience or annoyance. Sometimes you're in a hurry, right? And you're just so focused on what you've got to do that you forget to treat people uh, with the compassion and the dignity that they deserve. Sometimes you don't trust them. Sometimes you're frustrated or you're not getting what you want in a situation. Or sometimes... You just feel mistreated or put upon or, you know, feel a little sorry for yourself. And it just comes out of your mouth. So all those examples I just named and maybe the the motivation that you thought of in your own mind. This is how we can know that love is not rude because the things that motivate our rudeness are not fruits of the spirit. Okay, so frustration, mistrust, irritability, you know, 
frenzied, hurriedness type of thing. None of those are fruits of the Spirit. The way that you and I speak and the way we behave in those unguarded moments when something rude or inconsiderate comes out, that's the area where you need the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Right there. And and that's the beauty of the love of God working in our lives is because it can be a little thing that God will just go, eh, do you see that? Little things become big things. Now, I do want to add here as kind of a, a important note that God calls us to speak to others and to love them without rudeness and to speak to someone with dignity and compassion. But this is not an invitation for you to let other people treat you however they want to, okay? I'm always aware that whoever you might be today, if you're a part of our church or if you found this message online, if if you're in a situation uh, where someone is treating you badly, I don't want you to ever believe that the scriptures are telling you to continue to be a doormat for someone or to be um, treated poorly. Uh, They need to be exemplifying these aspects of love towards you. And so you can be upfront You can be assertive when you need to be. The scriptures are not saying love means you never say what you think. Love means that, you know, you're never uh, upfront about how you feel about something. The scriptures aren't saying love means you can't be straightforward. You can be all of those things. You can speak the truth in love. You You can say what you need to say, but you can do it in a way that, is not dishonoring to someone and is not uncaring and is not rude towards them. When I am deliberately unkind and rude to you, I'm communicating to you, whether I mean to or not, I'm communicating to you that I don't think you're as important as I am. I'm telling you that I'm more interested in getting what I need or want than in respecting you as a creation of God. Now, the sad thing is, is that we can be the most rude and inconsiderate to the ones that are closest to us. And in fact, when I asked you a moment ago to think of a time that you've been rude, um, oftentimes for me, it is the people that I actually love the most and have the most investment in. It would take a lot for me to actually just go off on the cashier at Publix, right? There's too many like, People watching, right? But it's in those unguarded moments that I let my guard down and I can make a snarky comment to Jason or to one of my kids or I can just be inconsiderate in those moments. And this is why Paul spells it out for us in the scriptures. Love is not rude. And then he goes on in the, rest, in the other part of verse 5 to say, it does not demand its own Way. I want to talk about that aspect. We've talked about rudeness. I want to talk about the aspect of love not demanding its own way. Other translations of that part of the verse uh, say love is not self-seeking. Now, our human instinct is to be self-seeking. If you doubt that, uh, ask a parent of a young toddler if you can hang out with them for a little bit. And you will see kind of those initial human nature instincts of like, I see that and I want it. That's now mine, right? Our human instinct is to be self-seeking and to put our own concerns above others. And we see this in the very first book of the Bible, the very first few chapters, the story of Adam and Eve in the garden when, when Eve listens to the serpent, right? And eats the fruit of the tree that God told them not to eat. And God comes and asks Adam and Eve, like, what happened? And Adam immediately, immediately serves himself by pointing the finger at his wife. That is our basis level instinct to seek out our own interest at the expense of other people. And Paul says, love does not do that. Now, as preparing this, I thought about the old joke (laughs) with you might know it, the bear and the two hikers, right? And if you haven't heard it, I'm great at telling jokes. I'll tell it to you. So these two friends, these two guys are out hiking, right? They're out in the woods and down the trail, they see a huge grizzly bear. 
coming their way. And so, of course, they panic. And the first thing they do is they run to this tree and they climb the tree. Well, guess what? Bears can climb trees, right? So the bear runs to the base of the tree, begins to climb up the tree. And the first guy, these hikers are up in the tree, the first guy kicks his hiking boots off of his feet and those fall to the ground. And then he grabs his tennis shoes out of his backpack and begins to put them on. And his friend says, what are you doing? The guy says, well, I figure if the bear gets close, you know, up this tree that I'm just, we're going to jump down and we're going to make a run for it. So I'm going to put my tennis shoes on. So the other guy says, are you crazy? You can't outrun a bear. The first guy says, oh, no, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. Right? So without the love of God, that was a good joke, right? Do you guys think that was funny? The crowd in here is just going wild. But it highlights an important human aspect of our nature, which is that without the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit working in our hearts, we are going to look out for number one every time. We're going to look to ourselves and look out for ourselves every time. But the scriptures tell us love is not self-seeking. So this kind of behavior, this rudeness, this um, putting, putting self first, this was a huge issue in the Corinthian church. And, and you can see in other parts of the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is dealing with the different dishonoring ways that the people were treating each other. From interrupting and speaking over each other in church to, like I mentioned, some immorality that was happening to like rivalries and court cases that were happening. Paul even talks about people coming to the gatherings, to the church gatherings, to receive communion and actually gorging themselves on the communion elements and that people were actually getting drunk on the communion wine and, and other people weren't getting any because other people had taken it all. Can you imagine visiting a church and it's time for communion and somebody just goes up there and just takes the whole thing. That's what was happening in the, ch in the church at Corinth. These were people that came together that wanted to know God, that wanted to love him, but did not understand kingdom culture. They did not understand the way of love. In Philippians 2, 3, 4, it supports these ideas that we're talking about today. It says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Paul knew when he wrote Corinthians that the only way this diverse church of people from all over the world and all kinds of different backgrounds, the only way they were going to walk with Jesus together and grow into a healthy, faithful life-giving church was that if they understood what God's idea of love really was. And honestly, we are no different. We have different backgrounds. We come from uh, different parts of the country. We have different opinions about things. Um, we've seen some of those differences this year, maybe now more than ever before. And we're no different. The only way we can continue to be a God-honoring church family that reaches other people with the message of the gospel, which that God loves them, that God has redeemed them from their sin, that God has a, a righteous path for them to walk on. The only way we can do that is that if we understand and embody the way that God has called us to live. And so... Although 1 Corinthians 13 may be familiar to you, you may have heard it a hundred times, to actually internalize and live that message is what we're all called to do and is what does not necessarily come naturally to all of us. So what now? To live this way is a lifelong exercise, right? It's lifelong mission to learn to embody this kind of love. And, 
And we never arrive as Christians. You don't ever graduate. We are always learning how to be nearer to Jesus, how to to love him more, how to love others more. So what I want to close with is just a daily practice of three different things, okay, that we can begin to embody. Number one is to repent. Repent. Repentance is not something that we do one time when we accept and receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, where we ask him to forgive us of our sin, and then, oh, good, well, I'm done with that. Repentance is a daily thing, and not even just daily. It's sometimes a minute-by-minute thing where we are continually confessing to God that we don't love others as he's called us to and that we need his help. And nothing reminds me of that more than reading through the scriptures that we've read today because I can think of the times that I'm impatient, that I'm looking out for me, even with the people that I love the most. So repenting is the first daily practice that you're continually putting yourself before God and saying, Lord, this is the way I want to live. This is the way I want to care for other people. I need your help. Lord, I'm about to open Facebook. Lord, go before me into that social media. I don't know what I'm going to see, but Lord, help me to respond in a loving way. So that's number one, repent. Number two, listen to God's word. Read it, listen to it. Find a way to get the word of God into your mind and into your heart. You can't embody what you don't actually know or understand. And so being around it, having it on your shelf, uh, is not going to get it into your heart. And so we talked about at the beginning that the Word of God, the Scriptures say in Hebrews, is living and active, meaning that it's not just the words on the page. It transforms you from the inside out. There is something about the word of God and reading those words, it changes how you see the world. It changes how you see other people, even people that drive you nuts. The transforming power of the word of God changes you to change how you see. The third daily practice, so it's repenting, listening to God's word. The third daily practice, put yourself around people that model the kind of life you want to live. It's quite simple, really. Find the people who treat others the way that you would like to be able to treat others, who who live this way, who practice these things. Find those people and spend more time with them. The scriptures say, uh, he who walks with the wise grows wise. That's in the book of Proverbs. When we become like those we walk with. This is why... This is why we gather as the church, because I will not be very good at this by myself. When we are isolated, that's when we get weird, right? That's when we get selfish. That's when our little world becomes all about us. You have got to get around people that love Jesus and that are modeling the kind of life Jesus calls us to live. Are they perfect? No, they're not. But they're walking in the right direction. Now, of course, if you're, if you're listening to this message, you're probably a part of a group of people. You're probably a part of High Point Church. And I just would encourage you to stay with this church family, to dig into these relationships, because it is with our in that kind of regular interaction and, and living life together that we learn how to love each other through the ups and the downs and the little moments and the big moments. It's all theory on a page until you're walking it out alongside somebody else that loves Jesus. So repent, listen to God's word, and be around other people who are doing the same. It sounds simple. It's not always easy, but it's a life that God calls us to live. Let's pray together. God, I thank you that you have called us to a new way, to a different way, that, Lord, you can empower us 
to love other people the way that you love us. Lord, make our hearts sensitive to your spirit. Lord, stop us in those moments that we snap out a rude uh, comment to someone or, or the times that we put our own interests above those of other people. Lord, help us to change. Help us to be different. Transform us, God, from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week. And we'll be back here next week for more of 1 Corinthians chapter 13.